Jeremy, so excited to have you here. Really excited to, to introduce you to the, the men's group community. You're somebody that I met recently, but I got to know quite quickly. And I'm, I'm really impressed with what you've been through in your life and and how you decided to help others with it. And also the the success, successful life you built despite all that adversity. So I'd love to start by having you give a little intro on yourself. Uh, who are you? What are you here to talk about? And uh, and also, you know, I guess some of the, the achievements you've had that you probably wouldn't usually brag about. I'd love to hear some. <laughs> we'll see if I can do that. Thanks for, uh, yeah, thanks yeah. for that. And just want to say thanks for having me on because I, I was actually really looking forward to having this this conversation with you. And as you mentioned, we, we haven't known each other for a super long time. But every time we, we get to chatting, it's like it's like we're best buds right away. And, and he's Yeah, yeah. instantly. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So my name is Jeremy Amiet. As, as you mentioned, I... Uh, I run a real estate company in Edmonton, Alberta, and um, I think the reason we, we want to have a chat is I, I recently wrote a book. I published it last year in April. Uh, it's called Self Assurance: yeah, Struggle, Confidence, and Success is the subtitle. And um, yeah, it's essentially it's a, it's a little bit of a memoir. Um, I had an unusual upbringing, and I, I really didn't think I would amount to much. And I and I, I've struggled. And continue to struggle with confidence in different uh, areas of my life and different points in my life and sort of a, a wave of up and down and or ups and downs, I should say. And I, um, I found a, you know, I, I think I was lucky that I had some, some good people in my life and some good mentors, um, accidental and some not so accidental. And I just found a way to, to turn most of my struggles into some, some genuine successes and just really make a, make a life that I, truly did not believe I ever could have, um, in, in every way, shape and form or not, not just about a financial success. Financial is, is one of them, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a small thing once you get to a certain level. Right. And so, um, yeah, it was something that I was ultimately proud of. I, I wrote the book with the intention of not turning it into a career path, not, not, not really doing anything, not even really having any expectation of, of how many people would read it or how many copies it would sell. Um, I wrote it with the idea that, you know, I've got two boys that are now 10 and 12, but when I had the idea, they were, they were young, they were two and four. And I thought I didn't really consider myself a very good dad with small kids, but, um, I thought, you know, I know that I have something that I can share with them. And if on the off chance that I'm not around when they're old enough to receive those messages, I'd sure like to have something for them to, uh, to leave with them. And, uh, so that was, that was my motivation behind it. And, and I just thought, you know, if, if anybody who, um, went through any similar struggles than I did, that I did, um, you know, if I affect just the life of one person and I don't even know who that might be, it's just, it's, it's worth the effort. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I like that about you that you want to take, you know, uh, all the wisdom you've earned and, and, and help other people with it with no real expectation or purpose or any kind of gain on the back end. That's fantastic. Yeah. Th you yeah. know, th there are some, some, some selfish benefits to it that I probably maybe knew would happen, but there's a lot of healing that there's a lot of healing that happened for me to be able to, because I had to actually be able to figure out how to articulate myself to myself so that I could, I could articulate it to other people. Um, and I think there's a lot of, you know, I wrote, I wrote five different versions of that book before the, or sorry, four different versions before the fifth that I actually published. And, uh, and even on the fifth, there's, you know, maybe half of the con, well, maybe 60% of the content actually made the book. Some of it was just like my own healing. And so I would actually recommend anybody to try it. It's, it's a, it's an incredibly different, difficult feat to get from start to finish on a book. Um, it's a roller coaster of emotions, but yeah, there's been, there's been so many, you know, feel good benefits back to me as well that I, I, I can't take all the credit for, for being completely selfless for it. Although that was my motive. So that's great. Well, I, I, I actually just made a note memoir for his kids because I was like, man, that's a great exercise. It might be a great exercise for the guys out there. Cause I was just thinking about all the lessons I've learned and how I've wanted to share them. And sometimes I've even in my life started to write them down, but then there's no purpose behind it. Right. So then I don't, I don't follow through on it the whole way. And I was like, that'd actually be a great exercise. Actually like do it with the idea that I'm going to pass it along to my kids or along to guys that I come across in men's group or otherwise that might need some guidance around mindset or their emotions or all these things we're going to talk about today. It's a cool legacy to leave because, um, I just think, you know, I, I, I would give so much credit to the things that I've learned and who I've become by the books that I've read. 
And when somebody writes a book that's incredibly personal, it's like they're, they're letting you into their world in a, a very personal world. And, um, it's such a gift because I think there's a lot of healing in just knowing that you're not alone, right? Just kind of like the same, same reason music might make you feel a certain way or, or just, just hearing that somebody that you look up to has a struggle that, um, that is similar to yours. All of a, all of a sudden you go, ah, you know, my, my situation's not actually as unique as I thought. And there's just knowing that there's some healing in it, right? I think there's a lot of healing. A uh, wise guy in men's group once said the most, two most powerful words in the English language are me too. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's, beautiful. that's right. Yeah, beautiful. that's great. And I, I, I really wanted to talk to you today because there's a lot of guys in men's group who are coming because they're facing a challenge. You know, they're, they're a new cha- phase of life. They don't have the skills for, maybe they're a new dad. Maybe they're wrestling with some kind of an addiction. Maybe they're going through a breakup or divorce. So they're coming in kind of, you know, feeling low in a down place. And I love your story and that you wrote this book because looking at you, and I'm going to brag for you here, <laughs> you're tall, you're handsome as fuck, you're fit, you got a beautiful family, uh, you've, you have a boutique real estate agency that is um, specializes in luxury sales, and you have um, some high-level pro athletes and celebrity figures as your clients. So it could be easy for guys to look at you and go, what, what does he have to feel low about? Why wouldn't he feel confident? Why wouldn't he feel assured of himself? So I'm really excited to dig into that stuff. Well, thanks. So for I, pointing I, that out. I guess we, yeah, I guess we can start there. Uh, sure. You're so humble. I, I feel like with all these guys I bring on the podcast, I have to brag for them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's not in my nature. I just I don't know why. I, you're saying all this thing. I'm like that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're killing it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you were heli skiing uh, a few months ago when I was in the area skiing too, and yeah. we almost connected there. And unfortunately, you t- tweaked a muscle in your back, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, st- I still made it the full three days, so it was, it was great. Yeah. yeah, so so let's start with that self self assuredness topic. So, like, yeah, a lot of guys might be looking at you even right now and being like, or people might run into you out in public, or maybe your clients like, wow, that guy has it together. Why would he feel a lack of assuredness about himself? Well, I guess maybe we would start with a little bit of my story. Um, so my, my, my dad was also a realtor as was my grandpa. Um, and he, he had a, a relative level of success. I mean, we had a pretty normal childhood from, for the first 10 years of my life. And, uh, what I didn't know that I found out, um, around that time was that he struggled with addiction and he struggled with addiction from the time he was a teenager, right through when it was kind of on and off, it would get more and more and less serious. And, you know, as a kid, you don't really know what's going on. Um, but, uh, but, um, he ended up, he had an addiction to crack cocaine that got so bad to the point where he moved out, he was homeless for several years. Um, before he was homeless, my, my mom didn't really have a choice, but she, you know, she had to leave him. Um, so he got in his own condo and I, I was a rebellious kid. I moved out of my mom's house. I couldn't handle, um, that dynamic. And I, I moved out when I was 13 initially. Yeah. Um, wow, that's early. sorry, I, I might've been just right on the cusp of 14 actually, but, uh, well, anyway, still, either way. Yeah. <laughs> so I moved out, I moved in with my dad, except that that was only for a few weeks because, um, I never saw him the entire time I was there. It was just like, there was no power. He had never gotten the power hooked up, just like this dark dungeony cave. And, um, and it was just in a bad part of town. There was, there was a murder right across the street from, you know, the payphone where I used to go, uh, call my girlfriend after school and stuff and there was no food i had i had no money um it was just a weird space and so i would i would i moved out of there and tried to move back in with my mom it didn't work out and um and uh just went from friend's house to friend's house until their parents just you know kind of asked kindly asked me to leave you know they would want to help out and so I, i really didn't feel like i belonged anywhere um and i i felt like i was the spitting image of my dad. He looks like me. He acts like me. Everybody always told me, you know, you, you're just like your dad. And, and so I thought I was doomed to the same life. And because I, w- and I was attracted to uh, certain types of people and certain um, activities, I guess we'll, we'll put it, that, that would lead me down that path. And um, so, yeah, so I, I guess I, th- I think there was always, because I was, I was always around older people because I moved out so young. I ended up moving in with my brother and his friends. And, um, and I think, I think I just always felt judged. I always felt like I wasn't enough. I always felt like I didn't, um, 
quite belong. People were stronger than me. They were better at anything that I did than me. Nothing, nothing came natural from any skill standpoint you can think of, whether it was sports or anything else. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I, I wanted to be anybody but me. And I, I really looked, looked up to people who, um, I, I really looked up to and admired a lot of people, but I never saw any of that in myself. Right. So, so yeah, I, I just thought I was doomed to that, uh, to just, a a crappy future. And, and, um, I mean, I was, I was certainly not the, the person you described. I, I was not that person. I was not motivated. I was, I was overweight. Um, I was a smoker. I was, um, you know, not fit, uh, just not at all this the same human that i am today i would i would say in a lot of ways right yeah well thanks for sharing that story i can relate to so much of it especially that part of like going through the world and everything is almost evidence that like you're not good enough like like admiring or envying it's probably a better word like yeah. everybody because there's always somebody better than you yeah and i and oh that just made me feel so insecure <laughs> or just reinforced it yeah 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 interesting and now you're in this place where things seem, seem to be going well. You know, we talked earlier about how you had a shoulder injury last year. We talked about that last time we chatted on the phone. Also, um, you know, some uh, the muscle or, you know, back issue from skiing recently and stuff like that. And, and you're not feeling like yourself. Uh, do you, you mentioned that you've been in a bit of a funk because of that, if you don't mind me digging into it. Did, did you find that you slipped back into that, any of that old... Um, low self-confidence, self-sabotaging, kind of like, um, low self-assuredness, like slip back in when, when you were feeling lower? Yeah, I think to some degree, I mean, it, you always, it's, it's easier to be confident when you're accomplishing everything at, you know, th especially things you've never accomplished before. And that's, that's really where I learned to, to, to build my confidence was to do more than I felt like I could. Right. And, um, so in my book, I wrote a chapter about excellence. Um, and, and I think that, that excellence is, is it's, it's like doing that extra two pushups when you think you have nothing left, but that's just a metaphor that, that could, that could be anything in life. It's just like, it's, it's making that phone call. You don't want to make it's doing like all those little things that you really don't feel like doing when you push yourself to do a little bit more, um, you initiate some momentum and, and, uh, and start to accomplish things that you never realized that you could. And all of a sudden that's where you draw your confidence because you're surprising yourself. Like, Oh, I can actually do more than I thought. Or I am more than I thought. Um, and so it's a, it's a great remedy to, to being in a funk. However, for me, because, um, I drew, a, I draw a lot of that from, um, not so much from, I, well, I'd like to, I'd like to say not from my, my business accomplishments, but I'd be lying if I wasn't because, you know, when things aren't going well, it's harder to be confident. Um, but then when I take that, that like the zoom out perspective. And I look at a longer timeline, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm in the moment right now. And it never feels good in the moment. But when you, when you just kind of zoom out and look at your perspective, it's like, there's always going to be ups and downs. And now all of a sudden it's not such a big deal because I mean, you're not stuck in that moment. Um, and so, you know, to the, to the point that you made about my, you know, my shoulder injury and, and my back, and I was having some, some kidney issues, which were all self-inflicted by the way, because I, I pushed myself very hard physically, um, for the reason that I like to practice excellence. So it's kind of a, a paradox here. Um, I had to zoom out and be like, it's just a moment. It's just like when things are good, you know, just wait. And when things are bad, just wait. Cause, cause things are always changing. And so I think, um, I have to remind myself not to, to curse the, the crap that I'm going through. Cause I always end up like anytime something that is, um, anytime I'm, I'm stuck with a, a challenge, um, or a struggle that, um, that I don't want to accept. Once I do accept it, I always end up coming out of it better and stronger than I've ever been. And so if I can remind myself of that in the moment, it's very hard to do. Um, it always works out. It really does. I, I think that's a really healthy mindset around all that. And really the point where I was trying to get at is that, is that even though externally it looks like you have all those successes, you are still, you know, hit, it just happened to be in a bit of, you were just coming out of a low period. Yeah. And just sort of trying to normalize that for other guys who are listening. Sure. Uh, I had a similar period after just moving. I was kind of burnt out, snapped my surfboard and moved my only surfboard. All the repair shops in, in, in town were full. So like, 
my one outlet was gone and all of a sudden I felt restless and kind of depressed and, you know, I kept things going and I tried to keep that perspective that you're talking about, which is like, you know, this is part of life, but like I, I had some, I had some, uh, you know, funky days. I could, I guess you could say. Yeah, it's true. And you know, sometimes they, they last a little longer than others. Sometimes they don't. It's always nice when it goes, when it passes by really quickly. But for me, this one, this has been a, this has been about a nine month funk. Um, yeah. I don't I haven't actually done the math, but I'm sure it's around nine months. So I, I injured myself <laughs> August 30th. So whatever that worked yeah. out to being, it's, uh, it's almost April now. And it, just like you, I mean, I can, I can relate so well because moving physically is my outlet and I push myself in a lot of, I've a lot of different disciplines and the parkour and Muay Thai and, um, and calisthenics and, and CrossFit and all of it. Um, and a lot of it, I can, you can't do with a, with, with a dislocated shoulder. I had two, two separate tears and, um, and then I had smashed my, my left knee as well. And then my liver was failing, um, for a massive dosis from actually working out too much or too hard. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe there's a lesson yeah, here. Yeah, I had issues with my right foot and I'm still trying to figure out how to move and, <laughs> Um, yeah, just, just losing my confidence. And, and also like, there's a, there's, there's a challenge with being in the right mental state, even just when your body is, is in pain. That's like, it's like your body is, your, your body's mad. So it makes you mad. Right. And, uh, yeah, just for, for, for a long period of, of darkness, um, you know, and it's winter and it's, I, I live in Northern Alberta. And so there's, there's some seasonal, there's always seasonal depression for me in, in that time period. You have seven hours of of sunlight and you, you don't see most of it cause you know, you're probably in an office or something. And, um, yeah. So, you know, even, even when things look good from the external and I keep reminding myself of that because I go like from uh, on paper, I have a, as you mentioned, I have a fantastic family. I'm still even, you know, as I complain about my, my fitness level, I'm still quite fit and, uh, and I feel good for the most part. Um, you know, my, my business is, my business is in the best place it's ever been. Um, financially I'm in the best place I've ever been. I drive a nice car. It's like, what am I complaining about? But yet there's still, there's <laughs> even though you have all the external thing and I shouldn't say family's external because it, there's some, a lot of great internal things there, but, um, you know, you, you would think that, that there shouldn't be anything wrong, but it's just a part of life. It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't matter what you you have or what you accomplish you're still going to go through the same stuff so you know that the cliche of of uh you know life is a journey not a destination it is it doesn't matter where where that thing is or where you are you're still going to go through the ups and downs right 100 percent. and i i had the luxury of um or i guess privilege of being able to do a men's group for entrepreneurs before i started a men's group that was for like a bunch of high achieving entrepreneurs and like these guys have everything you could ever want similar to you and they all you know we're still running into the same life, life challenges that most of the guys are coming to for men's group. So, yeah, you know, it seems like the only thing that doesn't change in life is adversity can be expected, you know? Totally. So it's cool to hear that you think that way as well. Yeah. So how did you, when did you realize that, Hey, maybe, maybe my self-confidence is the issue here. Maybe my self-assuredness is the issue here. Like what was that process like of sort of just starting to come to terms with it before you started to, work on it? Good question. Um, I'm in a sales business and I am base. I am introverted. I mean, I'm, I've certainly grown to be more extroverted than I was, but, um, in terms of, you know, my, my personality traits and who I am and, and what I would see or what even society or most of us would see as like a great salesman. I'm not, I'm not. Um, and, uh, and so, when I started real estate, I, I actually did, I mean, I struggled for the first six months. It was, was, was very scary, but, but all of a sudden after that six month mark, like something really happened. And I was I think in, in, a, in a weaker office. I was number two out of, you know, a hundred agents in my first year. And I, and I don't really know how I did it. And I realized that I was, I, there was, there was a different way to, to do sales. Um, and so, and that was, it was more relational and more from a consulting standpoint than from a sales standpoint. But I also realized that you still have to be, you still have to have the ability to influence and, um, people are much better influenced by 
somebody who is confident because that's actually kind of what you're doing. Like influence is a, it's a, it's an energy that you're drawing from, right? And if you're in a, if you're in a position where you need consulting help, for example, and I would say that from a real estate perspective, more than a sales perspective, because we're not like house salesmen, right? Like we, we help facilitate, um, your goals and we, we help, you know, we help you find a place. It doesn't matter. It's not like selling cars where you, if you work at a Chevy dealership, you got to sell the Chevy. And if they want to look at the Toyota, you know, sorry, right. With real estate, that's what I loved about it. was that it was like, well, you don't like this house. It doesn't have to be my listing. Cool. Let's go look at the other one. Right. So then you could, you could come from that more consulting standpoint. Like, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Um, and so anyway, so I went off on a tangent there, but you know, in terms of, of influence, I realized that, there's moments when when I self reflect, and the moments where I have more influence on um, my client and on the conversation, um, I I felt more confidence, and so I was drawing that out. And the moments where I didn't, I wasn't feeling confident. And there were certain people that um, that I started to realize. I'm like a, the certain archetype of 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 a male, for example, a, a strong man who maybe has um, Maybe it's even in size and stature, but it's, it's just even in their energy or, or um, in their presence, right? Some, they would intimidate me. And I'm like, I don't speak to them the same way that I speak to somebody who, um, who I feel is maybe put, this isn't necessarily the right wording, but puts me on a pedestal. And I realize what I'm doing is I'm putting them on a pedestal. And so, that, so that it was the thing about, you know, human hierarchies and we kind of, we have these hierarchies, right? Even within within the friend groups that we might not be conscious of it. And some of them might not be as quite as, as broad of a spectrum, but we have hierarchies. And when you put somebody above you, you actually tend to speak to them a little bit different. And I realized how important it was to, to not do that um, from both perspectives. Like don't put somebody else on a pedestal and don't put um, others below you. And when it's an equal playing field, now all of a sudden, like people feel significantly safer with you and you feel safer with yourself. And I actually think that's a, that that is a good definition of confidence because confidence is essentially it's 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 trust. Right. So the, the Latin word of confidence, the, the root word is fit, which is Latin for trust. And I thought, huh. So um, if confidence is trust, it's trust in what? And, it, and if it's self-confidence so it means trust in yourself it's trust in in um in life and trust in outcomes it's it's not having the the worries and the anxieties and the stresses and the the what ifs it's just to to, to go in with faith and so um so i became really interested in it because i knew i was missing it in a lot of terms and, and from a sales perspective it was like very apparent of like when, when it benefits or when I need it. And I'm like, just would sure benefit me to be confident right now because I can measure it. I, I, I would sell more houses, therefore I would make more money. Um, so it's easier to identify. And so that, that was kind of what drew me to, um, to being interested in it. And then I just started really kind of studying it. And I realized for as many books as I read, because I, I had mentioned, you, I don't remember if it was before we started recording or not, but books I would attribute to, a, in a huge way to uh, my success. And um, and so I thought, okay, so I would read business books, I would read sales books, I would read influence books, I would read um, discipline books, whatever I thought that I needed. And there was so much material on that, happiness books. There wasn't really that many books about confidence. And so then... Yeah, no, and there's... Right. No, there still aren't many great books about confidence. No, there's a few that are, are like specifically geared for women. I noticed, um, mm -hmm. I can't remember. I think one of them is called the, Co the confidence code and stuff. And so when you know, start, you start looking on Amazon and I'm like, all oh, the books are geared towards women. And I'm sure they're great. I'm sure I could have just read them and they would have been just fine for me as well. But like, why does it have to be just geared towards women? Maybe because they're just more aware that they actually need it. Like men, we need it as well. Um, sometimes some of us just, well, we just keep going, just keep running the ball downfield anyway. Yeah. Some <laughs> of us just pretend yeah. we have it right. And, and like, and that could be a dangerous yeah dangerous game too because sometimes if, like if you start to try to project that you're confident um and and you're really not you can start to lie to yourself and there's a like, it can just take you down a really bad path right if you if i think of like the loud boisterous um that the idea of uh of, of a salesperson who you know is is able to to talk about themselves all the time and self-promote like like nobody's business 
most of the time, it's actually the opposite of what you think. They, they, they're trying to project confidence, but they're usually actually very, very, um, it's, it's quite the opposite. I've noticed the same thing. It's like the people that are louder and most, and most projecting it, but like in an insecure way, not in a calm grounded, I feel safe with myself. I'm here to, you know, um, consult with you if you're trying to like dominate people or if you're trying to be loud and over the top, honestly, those are the people that, um, that it, they might be able to overcome that insecurity at work, but it's going to show up in other places, typically in their home life. Yeah. In like a really gnarly home life. Like, you know, like those are the kinds of guys that kind of go home and beat their wives or whatever, you know, like that, that those strong emotions they have about themselves and their lack of self-worth will shoot out somewhere. Yeah. Thanks for, so insecure was the word I was looking for. Um, I yeah. mean, it's a, it's a slippery slope in, in more than that. And, and some people may not go to that extreme where they're, they're going to, to beat their wife or anything, but, um, no. but I think, but I think when you live in that, in that, um, with that paradigm or with that, that, that operating system, I guess the challenge is, is you're not living authentically. Right. So you're not, it's like you're, you're lying to yourself. Um, not even knowing that you're lying to yourself, but, um, but you're not being authentic and therefore you're not really facing the things that you need to face and deal with. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned how there's not a lot of resources for confidence out there for men. And I see that like guys come into men's group and they're really confused about how to do it, about how to build confidence. And something that I learned along my journey and that I've seen guys struggling with is that people think they have to build confidence. Like it's something you have to somehow pull in from the external world or like by, by saying, I love myself over and over again, it's going to work. Um, but I love that word you said, it's actually just a self trust. It's like being, becoming just cool with yourself and who you are and how you show up. And for me, that was actually a journey of um, not building up my, I mean, there's a little bit of a positive affirmations and acknowledging what I do well and why, how I'm a beautiful person in the world. But it was more of actually crying out the negative things that I was still carrying around in my body from a similar upbringing to yours. Because I kept trying to tell myself I love myself and do the gratitude journaling and the and the all these things, all these personal development things and books, but really, like lingering below the surface was this feeling like I'm just not good enough mm -hmm. because that's what my dad made me feel, or that's what I interpreted mm -hmm. uh, from him. So I actually had to cry and get some of the anger and get get that stuff out, and, and then I actually started to feel really safe with myself. That self trust that just showed up curious to know if your part of your journey you know, getting into the self-assuredness was on that side as well getting into the negative feelings you had previously yeah i think you have to lean into them it's like like you know how do you get across a wall of fire well you, you have to cross it right and so so you, you have to be willing to you have to be willing to be vulnerable and that's where the like that's where real strength comes from and i know it sounds cliche to say you know your strength comes from vulnerable from your vulnerability but that's what it means is like to actually accept it you know as you're as you're talking and saying I, I love myself i love myself and you're only saying it because you know you don't love yourself in the moment i think that's what you said right it's like yeah so maybe the the better thing to do is acknowledge it and be like i don't love myself and why is that why don't I love myself? And then write it out. Like, I know for me, um, writing has always been uh, very therapeutic for me. And it generally starts off as negative, but it always turns positive if I just allow myself to keep writing. And and I think, like you said, I mean, a lot of times people, they're trying to draw their confidence from the external to the in. And that's, that is the idea of, you know, the, the person that I described that, that would uh, self-promote because he's trying to get other people to, to think highly of him so he can think highly of himself. Ugh. It's never going to work. It, it, like never, everything starts from the inside out, not the outside in success comes from the inside out. Uh, confidence comes from the inside out. Love comes from the inside out. It's very difficult to love somebody else if you don't love yourself. Um, all of it. And so, you know, it's like, I call it the right kind of selfish. And I actually talked about a little bit of that. Like actually, maybe I talked about, I think I called it healthy self-focus. Right. Because a lot of the times when I, I found when I became depressed or unhappy, I was actually thinking about myself too much. Um, and so there, there's this, this fine line of, of, uh, there's a danger in thinking about yourself too much, but there's also a danger of not thinking about yourself enough. Right. I've seen people do both at the same time, like that, that archetype you're, you're saying, and the, the people that are trying to project confidence, but they really don't feel good about themselves. They really don't have that self-assuredness, self-confidence. 
they will think about themselves a lot in the sense of how they appear to other people, but they won't actually practically introspectively look at themselves, dissect themselves with the journal or whatever other tools you use where it's like, what am I actually feeling? Why am I actually feeling that? How can I get into that and, you know, get through that? Yeah. It's almost like they do both. Like they're extreme. They can be extremely narcissistic in the sense that they're always worrying about their image, but um, yeah, they never dig into themselves. And you like, like worrying about your image is the worst thing you could ever do. Um, yeah. cause then you try to project the image of who you want people to think you are, but you haven't yeah. actually done it yet. So it's kind of a, that's it's smoke and mirrors, right? Um, it's very, it's, it's, it's very dangerous. And so the flip side to it is that if you're really going to acknowledge it and you are in a dark place, like it is, it's hard and that's why we don't want to do it because it's, it's difficult to acknowledge all of your real emotions and, and thoughts and who you think you are. And, but you can't change anything you, that you don't accept first. Right. So the minute that you accept and said, this is where I am, but this is where I want to be. Now, all of a sudden you can be real with yourself. Right. Totally. Would you say that's step one and probably the most important step? I feel like it is. I feel like that's the step a lot of people in society are missing is society is kind of pushing us to distract ourselves and not be in touch with our feelings and what's going on and what were things we're actually going through. People don't dig into that stuff. They just avoid and distract and avoid and distract and numb pretty much their whole lives. Um, and it seems like the first step towards self-confidence, self assuredness is going, okay, what am I actually feeling? Oh, why am I feeling those things? Where do they come from? What does that feeling remind me of from my past? You know, would, would you agree with that? Oh, a hundred percent. It's, 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 uh, I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can get to where we all ultimately want to be, even if we can't really articulate what that place is without being real and authentic with ourselves. And I, and until you acknowledge it, it's like they, they talk about drug addictions. And of course I got to learn a lot about that through, through my, my dad's journey. And, um, the, you know, the, the, what do they call it? This alcoholics anonymous that all, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 12 step. Um, yeah. you, you have to hit rock bottom. And when you hit rock bottom, it's like, cause they know they're at rock bottom. They've acknowledged it and they're like, Oh man, my life, is not going in the right direction yeah but until they did that they weren't they weren't acknowledging it right it was everybody no. else's fault they weren't taking everybody else's fault yeah would you say that the majority of people are like that i would say based on my interactions and similar with you I'm a, i've been a man about town i get to meet a lot of different people i would say the majority of people fall on that side of the spectrum i just think not, not a lot of people have been taught those skills by their parents or by their friends or whatever would you agree with that? I don't want to agree with it. <laughs> yeah. Do. yeah, neither do I. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, but I, I would, I guess I would say that. I mean, I, I hate painting a, a, a brush with a wide stroke like that, but it is true. I think that, I think that we could, we, we could all look more internally. And I think we've all been sort of um, primed to make our, um, our livelihood, everybody else's responsibility to some degree. It's like the idea of, and I, I, I don't think there's situations where you shouldn't sue somebody because they did something to you. But like, I always thought of that in the, in the U S it's a little bit easier to sue somebody because it's like, you're always trying to make somebody responsible for your blunder, right? You get burned at McDonald's and you sue McDonald's or whatever. It's like, <laughs> yeah, why don't you just take some responsibility, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I asked that question almost to make guys feel more at ease if that's been them, if they're at this mm -hmm crucial turning point now where it's like they're just starting to look at themselves and we have a lot of guys coming into our community at like 45 50 you know and it's like they're starting the personal growth journey they're starting to look at themselves and i just wanted to take the pressure off by hearing that like oh yeah no it seems like a lot of people don't go on this journey ever because it's hard and that that's a good thing that you are at any age you know i think if you're more interested in in the result like if you it's if you know what it is you want like let's say you're overweight um you could you could blame society for making healthy food on like not that easy to get. <laughs> and we're saying, well, I didn't really learn about health from my parents or from, but it's like, but now, you know, so now it is your responsibility because you're aware of it and there are ways to eat healthy and, and live a healthy life and all that stuff. So you, you can't blame it on anything or anyone, but yourself. Right. Uh, totally. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, when, once you, because the, once you accept full responsibility, it means you've let go of any excuse, right? And you can't have excuses and results at the same time. 
right? So when you let go of your excuses, there's nothing left to do but just to get to work and then you get the result. I love that. You can't you can't have excuses and results at the same time. I've never heard that before. Yeah. That's great. I love that line. Um, speaking of like uh, lines and, and details, not to get too much into semantics here, but you speak of self assuredness you speak of self, self-worth, confidence. It seems like to me that there'd be a, there'd be difference between confidence. It's almost like confidence is a result that comes as a byproduct of building self assuredness. Like confidence is really how you're showing up in the world with other people and stuff like that and how you feel when you have to go show up to things, but really self assuredness, that self trust is a different thing. Would you agree? Or how do you think about those, those different things? Yeah, I kind of look at them as like as cousins, right? And I would say that that's that confidence is compartmental because I can be I can be a confident skier, I can be a confident uh, speaker, or I can, but I can also lack confidence um, at the same time in other areas of my life, right? Like, yes. like if you go put me on a dance floor, I'm, I'm not confident. <laughs> totally. <laughs> right. But like, I, I think self assurance is kind of that all encompassing. Like, I'm okay with all of that. I know that I'm not good at certain things. I know that I am good at certain things. And I think that, um, I would, I would look at self assurance as I also know that if I wanted to be good at something, because now I'm, I'm, I'm confident, I'm confident in my ability to develop my abilities, right? I'm, I'm comfortable with myself and, and because I, I can say that, I don't know if I've ever actually said it out loud, but I, I can say that I love myself and, um, and I can be compassionate enough to say you're not good at this thing but if you remove yourself if you, if you take your ego out of the equation and again as i talked about if i'm just more interested in the result then i'm i can be way more open to learning and I can say well, who can teach me this right so i always thought i was a, a, a really weak singer i was like i couldn't sing on key and stuff but i wanted to to be better at it because i like playing guitar and i love music and um and so i'm like where can i learn how to sing it's like i can just keep saying that i'm not a good singer and i'm not confident i didn't feel confident singing in front of other people it's like well why don't i just go learn that because every anybody can develop abilities i might not get to to uh you know the superstar level but i can get to a point where i'm like i'm good at this and so i think that's one of the reasons that i i really like i don't want to say dabbling because it's it's much deeper than dabbling but i like trying a lot of different things and, and focusing on it for a while because it helps me it helps me it helps to remind me that I can get good at anything I want. And so it, it, it helps me grow, like growing confidence in different veins of different things helps me grow my self-assurance, like the all encompassing, like self-confidence. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way. I, uh, right now I'm learning to surf again. So I, I surfed when I lived in Mexico for five years and that took five years off cause I got sick with Lyme disease which was a super dark time. And now I'm living back in a surf town again. And I'm like almost middle-aged and I'm way, way out of shape because of, you know, the health stuff. And I'm probably like 20, I was, I have been, when I got here, 25 pounds overweight, way heaviest I've ever been. Luckily I've lost a bunch since, but like the process of learning to surf, I don't really have a specific goal in my mind as far as like what I need to look at. Oh, I need to look cool. I need to do this thing, but learning to surf and actually progressing and seeing progress in my surfing, being able to take off on bigger waves more confidently, being able to get more rides, do more fun things. It just makes me feel so good about myself. Yeah. And I wish, I wish every guy could experience something like that because I think that is true self-assuredness, right? Totally. Just being proud of myself, just being proud of myself for committing to something, for how I'm showing up, for how much I'm dedicating myself to it, studying it, and then seeing progress. Yeah, there's that fine line with like going in there with the attitude of being unattached to the outcome, but still like, you know, you're still aiming at a certain thing, like I want to get better at this. But if, you, if you're if you not super hard on yourself when you're not accomplishing it, um, it then you start to enjoy the process, right? It's like, okay, well, that didn't work. There's just one more way it didn't work. Okay, I got to adjust this. I got to adjust that. And and because I know I've been in that spot where I just want to be so good at something right now. And then I'm frustrated and I don't want to do it anymore because I wasn't as good as fast as I thought I could be, right? It's like, well, no, no, that's what I mean by enjoying the process. But I also, I, I really, I think because I, because I moved out of my house uh, really young and I tried to grow up really fast. I mean, it, right out of high school the minute I could I went and worked on drilling rigs so I could try to make as much money as I could and then got into a business and and um I stopped playing when I was like 10 because I, I grew up too fast and I didn't realize the importance of play 
I would say surfing is play. Um, any sport is play. Um, I started I started doing parkour when I was I think I was about thirty years old, maybe a little bit older. And like I hadn't done anything like that in forever. And I, I learned how to play, and it is it is you, like you think of it as this this you don't think of it as this important thing, or at least I never did. And I realized how important it was, like to to feel like a kid again, to go through all those motions, to get better at stuff. It's like and as adults, a lot of times we just stop playing. And then some of the some of us try to live vicariously just through our kids. And it's like, no, you go play, go do that thing. Or we watch. We watch, you know, NHL or NFL or NBA on, on TV and we're like, it's like, those guys are having fun. Like you like go actually do it. It's actually funner to do it than to watch. Right. Yeah. You're just watching other people have fun. Yeah. I can relate that too. Cause I've seen myself getting patterns of that where I'm away from the ocean and I'm in, I'm just an ocean guy. So I've always been, found it to be my source of play. Um, and, uh, I don't know what to do with myself and then I'm not doing anything and I'll go months without having play and wonder why i'm feeling so grumpy yeah 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 it's, it's it. true it's like it's like you I, for a while i don't know if you're like me but i i, I kind of saw it as a um maybe a luxury or something that i had to earn and i'm like I, I don't think i was looking at it the right way i think it's it's actually something that's like i i'm disciplined in my play now like there's play time every single day and some of it might just be going to the gym because that that might be play for me um, but it's important because you, you release all your stresses and you, you get through that, you know, hopefully you can get into that flow state. Um, and then you just remind yourself not to take life too seriously, but there's all the other benefits you talked about already. Um, not to mention just the physical movement, which we're, we're meant to do. Right. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the challenges with, with, um, feeling down or related to your body in some way, shape or form, it, it could be your diet. Um, if you don't eat good food, you generally don't feel good, which makes you not feel good inside. Um, and uh, and if you don't move around, it's the same thing too, right? So yeah, hundred percent. Friend of mine uh, called it meaningful play, not just play, but like meaningful play, or or you know, adding it like reframing it into something that is necessary. Um, and I think it's different if you're going to the club and dancing or like that could be, that could be play and fun, but, or if you're doing certain things, but like sports, you know, activities, music, there's so many ways to get that meaningful play and even just rolling around with your kids, you know? Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that. Cause I think that's, that's what we tend to default to, especially in my twenties. Like my idea of play was going to the bar and getting hammered. Right. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. Well, <laughs> it doesn't feel very good in the morning. Um, yeah. And I, and, and actually like for, for a long time, all of my, my close friends, it's like, if we didn't, it was the only way we knew how to quote unquote play was like sit around in a circle, have some drinks and talk and laugh. And like all of that social thing is, is really important. But when it's the only way that you know how to have an outlet, it's, it's not super healthy actually. So it, right before COVID came in, I never actually did it. Um, I, I wanted to put a group of guys together as sort of a group that would just go and, and play, like do something, go mountain climbing or um, cycling or do something once a month where it's just like, that's, it's, it's guy time, it's play time. Um, but it doesn't just involve like you want to have drinks because for them, something different, you know? Yeah. I just, I just, um, I was just surfing this kind of remote wave. I showed up and I wasn't, um, it's like a secret wave that you only see in the videos and it's kind of like you gotta know you gotta know somebody to be there, and so I paddled out there, and I was like worried to be there. I was scared that I was gonna get vibed or told to get out of the water or something. And this big burly guy was there, and he got a big he got a good wave. So I said, "Hey man, good wave," and he ended up being really friendly. He ended up being really really chatty. And it turned out he didn't have a friend to surf with, and so I got his number, and we've been surfing together. And he's really keen to learn as much as I am. And that process of sharing that with a guy and like cheering on each other's wipeouts and stuff like that is like. And laughing about it after has been probably the most fulfilling thing. I mean, don't tell my girlfriend or my dog, but that's probably been the most fulfilling part of my weeks. The last few weeks is like, you know, crashing around with my buddy out on our surfboards or whatever. Yeah. So I can definitely relate to that. Huh? Yeah. Good for you. I mean, I think we're, we're all wired to, to, for, for some bonding like that. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, one quick, uh, side note here, and it's meant to be a compliment is that, okay. So you, you worked on the oil rigs. You grew up, had to grow up early. You work in real estate now, all pretty like hyper masculine kind of situations and environments. So 
have you always had like a well-developed feminine side as well, softer side? Because when you and I first talked for, for a real estate deal we were going to do together, um, it was like I was, I was amazed that you could instantly get into the real talk with me and talk about the real stuff. And that's why we developed a friendship. Has that always been there? Or is that something that came with the work that you did when you were working on your self-assuredness? It's a great question. Um, nobody's ever actually pointed that out. <laughs> um, ah. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I think there's a part of me that's that it's always been there. Um, the 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 males in my life when I was growing up were uh, the stereotype males who could not talk about their feelings and emotions and my my intuition, uh, especially for my dad. So so my dad um, my dad has that side but buried it. And she's a very um, sensitive, emotional, like caring human. We've always known it, except that it's like, you know, it came out in a, in a weird way when well, obviously his, his addictions were, were really taking over his life. And I should actually say that he, he like, it's been about five years that he's been sober. So he, it was a 50 year journey and we had like given up Whoa. and he's, he's like, he's back. He's, he's a, a normal grandfather to my kids. And. Um, wow. Great wife. Awesome. Super cool, actually. Yeah. Oh, cool. So I think it was, maybe it hasn't even been five years that it, it the, the day that I received my book before it was published was, was like his two or three year anniversary, um, of his sobriety. And I thought that was really kind of, kind of cool. So anyways, I just wanted to mention that on a side note that he's, he's doing really well, but, um, my uncle committed suicide, uh, probably, oh. I don't know, six, seven years ago. Um, all of the Sorry to hear that. Yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, it's and it, it all just it, it stemmed from not being able to be real with their emotions, and that's why I, I talked earlier about about being authentic and being real, not burying things and thinking that you're supposed to just look tough because if you don't feel tough, like acknowledge it, and you'll eventually get tough, right? Um, and I th I think I intuitively just knew that it was not a healthy thing to bury things. My dad. Um, an addiction. I had heard this from, from, do you know who Dr. Gabor Mate is? Yeah. 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 yeah he's in Vancouver. So Vancouver, he's around, yeah. 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 I, I heard him on a Tim Ferriss podcast once and, and, um, that actually was the best talk I'd ever heard about addictions. It was just right around the corner from when my dad started to come back into our lives. And, um, it helped my whole family heal from, from that. And even my dad hearing it, it was like, wow. But what he talked about was just that the addiction where I was kind of trying to figure out the, you know, we look at the symptoms and, and, uh, we wonder why, and it's usually like, what is that emotional thing that you're, that you're trying to bury and like wild how, how a human brain works, but he didn't even realize he, he, I think he, he, he personally genuinely even forgot. So that's how much we, look, we can lie to ourselves. He'd been abused when he was younger and, uh, by one of his uncles, I believe. Um, I don't know if I should say that on a podcast, but whatever. It's all good. Sorry. Um, we don't know what so. their names are. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Do that. yeah. So, um, so of course there was an addiction because he was trying to, he was trying to run away from that pain. Right. It was like, what if he just accepted it? And it like, wouldn't have been easy. Like there's, there's, there's no easy way to, to, to go through that and to deal with it. But imagine if he was just open. Cause I think like even just talking about it, it's like, it's like an energy that just releases from you and, and there's healing in that. Right. And, um, and so I, I think I just naturally always, um, intuitively knew that burying stuff's not a good idea. And I, I connected well with, with, uh, with women just in general, I, I've always had good close friends, like some of my, my best friends throughout any period of my life have, have been women. And, um, I even, you know, I tend to, I finally actually learned how to work better with males because I'm like a completely different person with males than I am with females, depending on who they are. Right, I have the the tough side and the the not so tough side. But uh, but in real estate, I, like you know, my team was essentially built of it was it was all women originally, um, and so. Um, but it's like yin and yang, like we, we need a little bit of, of all of that. And, and we have a little bit of, of both in us. And, and I know, you know, working on, on rigs, it was definitely like the, the stereotype, especially 20 years ago, I'm sure it's a little bit different now, certainly even more than 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, yeah, some of the, the, I was like, you watch people with that, the stereotype macho attitude. And you can like, if you, if you look from an outside perspective, 
like you're watching like a National Geographic video or something or Planet Earth video. It's like you can see the things unfold and the, and the reason that things happen in their lives because of the way that they act, right? Um, yes, 100%. Both good and bad. And so I, I think if you look from that perspective, which can be really tough sometimes, sometimes I'm in that zone where I'm like, I'm watching reality, except that I think that I'm watching a movie. So you see it from a different perspective. And um, yeah, I, I, I think I've always intuitively known it. And of course, reading books have influenced my thinking and acknowledge that it's okay to have that, that more tender feminine side too. And sometimes I forget, I'm like, I can be a Jekyll and Hyde that way too. So. Yeah. Well, I just think you're a great example of having both. And I think you're, I just wanted to ask that you know, an encouragement for guys to maybe you know, be open to developing that, uh, that feminine side, because it doesn't mean you're going to lose your masculine. Right. No. Yeah. Not at all. It's, uh, I think, I think it's super, it's a, it's a good point to make. I think it's super important. I like to have that, that balance of, of the male type of bonding and then the more, um, tender side of the, the more feminine so they want and that could be with men or it could be with women or whatever so yeah and that that's why for example my somebody's my personality type why i would be friends why i would want to be friends with you why we are building a friendship because i know you and i could go ski or go do whatever go bike and we could razz each other and whatever but then it, when push comes to shove if like we find ourselves in a difficult situation i know you're you're probably going to be fair about it you're probably not going to get um um over the top upset or try to dominate me or whatever, you know, it's like, because you, you, you have the, 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 you can balance that masculine with your more softer side, you know, I think that's a skill. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Think, I think there's some, some real power in being, uh, being aware of when things serve you and when they don't. Right. Mm -hmm. True. And so you mentioned books and you mentioned journaling when you were like starting to get into your self-assuredness journey and you were like really, uh, okay, this is something I need to work on. You're recognizing the difference in interactions with people in your real estate career. What tools, or what were the first steps you took around to, to start to work through this low self-confidence, self-assuredness you were feeling? You mentioned books and journaling earlier. Are there any, are there any other tools that were helpful? Love to hear about that part of the journey. Yeah. I don't know if I would, I, if I could, if I could articulate a, a a process beyond that because it's it's still a process right and it's just a it's just this this lifelong journey i think the the moment i was aware that i i needed to to elevate my level of self-assurance i um um you know that that was that was a good start i think that knowing who i am being comfortable in who i am and i think especially in our 20s we're like trying to figure ourselves out um trying to figure out how to make good decisions um you know, one, I suppose one of the tools that I could use, and I, I did write about it in my book, was was values to be to 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 take that that time to actually articulate what is most important to you, what your real values are, because your values are kind of like they're your compass, right? Um, so how you make decisions, um, if it serves those values, then you're probably moving in the right direction. And I think a lot of the times, what can happen when when we don't when we're feeling low, it's because we violated something in our value system, right? Mm. When you say values, you mean core values. What, what is a core value? Give me some examples for those guys who don't know. Okay, here, so here's an example as I'm talking. Um, a lot of times um, we make our decisions based on money, especially if you're in a business, if you're in sales, if you're in something that, um, that drives you, or like if you're <laughs> you lent money to a buddy, it's like, and you get in a fight about it because it, you didn't pay you back, or I don't, I don't know what the situation might be, but we're sometimes we place more value on money than we do on our relationship with a friend. And mm -hmm. how many times mm -hmm. have you heard people like marriages ending in uh, ending because of money? It's like, which oh, yeah. where's your value system there, right? And that's what totally. I mean is like, because sometimes uh, you know society. The, the ideas of success and what what we feel like is we're supposed to be chasing because of what we see probably and, and I don't really know how to describe society but I, I suppose it's what we see on Instagram and Facebook and 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 all of the things of, that we think we're supposed to care about which you know could be money and cars and it could be all of those things and they're not evil like 
I like, I have a nice car. Um, I do like money. I, yeah. I do like uh, business success and all those things. They're not evil, but they're not the thing to be chased. And I will not compromise them over things that I know are more important to me. So um, things that I know are more important to me are like my family. I remember watching a lot of agents. And when I, when I first started, I would, I was working at least 80 hours a week, usually more like a hundred hours a week and everything fell took a, a, a backseat to business opportunities, right? So if somebody needed to go see a house right away, I was on it. And I was an individual agent, so I didn't have a team and it was it was harder to do that. And then my wife got pregnant and I and I remember watching and hearing what all these people who said, well, you know, real estate, everybody's divorced and everybody and it's like it's like that in every industry to be honest. But yeah, um but I did true. right like like don't just it's not just realtors it's everybody else but we have a, an easy excuse because your phone can ring at any time there can be an opportunity and you can go make some money and just just leave but if business was truly the most important thing to me there's no chance that i could still be married and have a great family and a great life because um because they would have taken a back seat to it and, and not to say that sometimes i don't have to i like i've got to make sacrifices sometimes because business is still important it's still up there but one thing doesn't have to cannibalize the other. I just have to get more creative on how to build a business where I could still serve my clients the way that I wanted to um, and still have a great family life and still take care of my health and all of those things because they all complement each other in the right way if you if you figure out how to manage yourself and manage your, your schedule. But um, but if push came to shove and if, if, if it had to be a, a deal or – uh, you know, a, a money thing over a relationship or whatever the, the case might be. I know what my value system is and I know where I'm, I know what I'm going to choose. Right. So I can be confident in that. That's how I grow my confidence is because I know who I am. I know what I stand for and I know um, how I make my decisions. Right. So, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the root word fid and confidence is trust. So I know I trust myself and I don't mm -hmm. trust myself if I violate my values. Interesting. Yeah. And core values typically don't change. That's how I understand them. Eh? You're like, your core values are typically always be there. Yeah. I, I think you can define them in different ways as, you know, I, I think like humans, we're, we're always evolving um, individually. Right. And and I think that our tastes and the way that we just view life can, can change and evolve. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think that, and I think there's, there's some values ingrained in, in all of us that I, I would like, you know, I, I see they're my values, but I'm like, they're kind of like human values. Right. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of them, right? Mm -hmm. Just certain things that are more powerful than others and that are, are going to always garner better results. Like if, if, if all of your decisions were, were, were based on, on an act of, of love, it's like, you, you can never really screw up. You might like lose some money or whatever, but it's like somehow you always gain it back. Right. Totally. Yeah. Um, for me, it's like, I've noticed my the, the core values can seem just be so different from other people's like my love of the ocean. Let's go back to that. For, most people look at that and go, that's pretty mature. Sean surfs every day. Like, why would he go do that? Why would he put himself in harm's way of these big waves? And the answer is because that's the only place where I ever really played with my dad. You know, that's where we connected. That's the only place I really saw him happy. You know, and uh, so for me, every time I go back to the ocean, it's like I, I feel like it's the biggest, most meaningful playground I could ever, you know, I could ever have. And so that's core value of mine. And I, I I'll always have to live near the ocean. I'll always have to be by it. And, um, you know, if I were to be with a partner who didn't share that core value, there's no way I can get around that. We're always going to be, you know, not bashing against each other. And it's the same thing for money, how you spend money, which you mentioned religion, how you want to raise children, how you want to spend your free time. Um, what, what you believe your social life to be like, if you're, if your core value is you really value your, you know, quiet time, then being with a super extrovert probably isn't going to go so well, you know? So I think, I think that's really wise to dig into your core values advice yeah yeah and i think i mean to, i suppose to the point where um you're mentioning if, if you're introverted and you have an extrovert sometimes it's good it's good to have for somebody to balance you out i think you you, you need some of that but um but yeah i think when, when you know what you stand for you you and you stop compromising things um for the wrong reasons uh you you really start to you really start to trust yourself right trust the, the path that you're on and, and, and that's, that is what confidence is, right?
Yeah. Um, so I have one more question just on taking responsibility, but like, um, there's so many other topics I wanted to get into today from your book, which is awesome. Self-sabotage, confidence, ego. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about it another time. Yeah. But uh, just quickly, are there any other tools or any other practices you found useful? You mentioned journaling, reading a lot of books, you know, getting like really digging into your core values, what you find important. Anything else on your on your journey of building self-assurance that was was really impactful and helpful? Well, I mentioned reading. Um, I would also mention, so, you know, in, in some form, uh, uh, the author can be your mentor, but I think it's, it's just really good to have mentors in your life and they don't have to be like a guru of any certain form, but the cliche that you are the average of who you surround yourself with is absolutely true. Um, and so I think you want to be really aware of, of who you're spending time with and make sure that those people in some way, shape, not, not necessarily in every way, but that they are in a place where you would like to be or, or accomplishing things you'd like to accomplish or being the person that you'd want to be. Right. So like if you, if every one of your friends is, is divorced and hates women and stuff, I can like, I'd be shocked if you didn't eventually get to that point as well. Or if every one of yeah. your friends was very successful in, in, in business, I'd be shocked if somehow you didn't find a way to get successful yourself. Right. And so, but I think just being able to talk it through and I, I, I feel so blessed, um, that, uh, I have people in my life like yourself that you, that are willing and able to have these conversations. Cause, um, I think that a lot of the times it'll go back to, you know, who, um, the, the family in my life, the men in my life, um, were, and I, I feel like they didn't feel safe enough to be able to have those conversations. And if you can't, like, it's, it's one thing to, to be able to self-reflect and all of that. It's another to be able to share with somebody else. And there's, there's a lot of healing that I, I don't know that I could ever, um, heal any of my, my issues without talking about it. And a lot of, and my, my natural disposition as open as I am is that when I'm in the moment, it's really hard for me to share those vulnerabilities. And, but like, man, it's a, like what I even accepted, what I talked to you about before this, this, uh, recording started with my, with my issues, I finally just accepted it. And I told, I have a, a personal coach and a mentor who I mentioned in my book, Richard Robbins. And I finally just told him yesterday, I'm like, I'm really struggling. I'm really struggling with the path that I'm on. He had no idea. Maybe he did, but I mean, I didn't tell him. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But the moment that I like allowed myself to just say it out loud and say it to somebody, it's like all of a sudden I had I not full clarity, but I had um, I was on the the path to getting significantly more clear on where I wanted to be and what I needed to do to get out of this funk. Right. Yeah, get around the right people, talk to them about it. I guess the last question on the self insurance in this journey was you mentioned before that like it'll be a lifelong journey. For me, I've, I've accepted the same thing that I'll always be on the side of low self-confidence, low self-worth. Some people are on the other side where they can't, they're too confident, they can't take responsibility, but like, I'm always going to be on this side. But the idea that this is a lifelong journey aside, like how long did you take, how long was your self-assurance journey from when you noticed kind of like you needed to work on it to like you started to see a lot of progress? Um, I think a lot of guys have a miss, um, an unrealistic expectation of like how long these, this kind of work can take. And I just love to hear, you know, what the time was like for you with your going, going from a place where you're really struggling with it to like, Oh, I'm in a better place and, and still working on it. But you know, like where you're at today, where things are pretty good. Yeah, uh, that's tough. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that. I'll go back to what I said about confidence, which was like, I think that even in those moments, I still, there was still always something I felt relatively confident in as much as, 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 as uh, insecure as I felt in other ways. And so um, it was sort of that balance of, of, you know, leaning into the things I was already confident in and also working on the, on my weaknesses. Um, and so it's a tough one to answer. Um, I, I feel like, I feel like it took me a good 10 years um, to, well, let's say 30 years really, but I mean, from, because I, I lacked confidence and then until I was aware of it, it was, you know, maybe 21, 22. And I'm like, I need to, I really need to work on this. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it that's was, early, well, by the way, good for you. Yeah. yeah well, into my thirties, like forties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in my thirties before I really felt like I knew who I was and I, and that, I think there's, there's an age component to it as well. I think when you're 20, you're still just, you are just still molding yourself into who you want to become. And, 
Um, and then, you know, and that, that's again, just another full circle to why it's so important to, to be clear on who it is you want to become, because if you don't know who you want to be, then chances are you're going to end up being somebody you didn't want to be because you didn't, it, you're just kind of floating along with whatever's going on in the world. Right. Um, yeah, I love that. And, and so I guess the last question I want to ask you is just around taking responsibility. Um, how did that play a role in you building your self-worth, self assuredness and like, um, what did that look like for you? You know, what did take, taking responsibility mean for you as a man? I read a book for, I love Navy SEALs because they're just like, they're, they're just tough dudes. And I, 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 I feed off of that. Um, but I read a and book. They're successful and they're like the most extreme versions of society. Yeah. You know, they're like they're the most elite <laughs> men there are. It's totally. like Navy SEALs. Totally. It's yeah. like, you don't mess with yeah. those guys. Um, yeah. there's a, uh, an author called Jocko Willink. Um, and he wrote a mm-hmm. leadership book. It's called extreme leadership. And so there were moments where he had, uh, like something, a situation happened in Iraq and uh, his subordinates who they had messed up the, they had messed up the, the mission and, <clears throat> and he could have completely, they didn't follow his orders in a certain way. And I don't remember exactly what the story was, but most people would have let them take the fall for it because it was kind of their fault. Um, but they would always own it and they would just say like, what could we have done better? What systems could we have put in place so that this doesn't happen? And he always put it on himself. And a lot of the times the leader is like, he's afraid because um, if he takes the fall, like maybe he loses his job or he just doesn't look as good or whatever. But when they own it every time, um, it's amazing what it does for everyone else on the team. And all of a sudden they learn to start kind of, they feed off of that, that ownership as well. And I think for me, like hearing that message, it, it made me realize that like everything is my fault. <laughs> and I don't mean that from a like, woe is me. Like, uh, but, but I own it. It's, it's, there's a difference in, in an attitude with just accepting responsibility. And, and uh, when I say responsibility, I mean your ability to respond, right? Because you can't control all of the actions that happen, but you can always control how you respond to them and how you respond to them is a big part of the equation. I remember hearing, uh, a Jack Canfield quote, and it was a formula, actually, it's E plus R equals O. And it was event plus response equals outcome. And you can't control the event, but you can control the response. And that's half of the equation, right? And so to me, it's like when I can release my ego, because my ego is wants to protect whatever idea I had of how things happen and whatever, but I'm more interested in, in the outcome the end of the equation, I go, okay, how do I mold myself to, to make this work? And, um, and that's been a, a, a really big thing for accepting responsibility. When I realized that it's like, there's magic in it because, and there's so much power in it. Cause when I accept responsibility for things that we generally tend to not want to accept, we'd rather have the excuse, right? Not the result. Um, now all of a sudden, like when I started to put that into practice, I realized how much more I could accomplish in life. And that's fun. It's way funner than having excuses, right? Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. And, and it, it gives you, I imagine it would just give you a, a, a deep sense of confidence knowing instead of avoiding this thing that's over here looming, it's like, I'm going to address it. I'm going to get into it. And I can change, I can take steps to, to, to change it. I find that even that process, once you get through the first hard part, gives me tremendous confidence, maybe more than anything else. Yeah. And sometimes you can't necessarily control when that outcome happens, right? Like, cause if you wanted something to happen now or in the next two days or whatever the, the case might be, I don't know, I'm an example of, of a situation, but, um, when you're unattached to when it happens, it's like, you're like, do not be attached to that result yet. Just be attached to, um, your own behavior, right? To your own effort yeah exactly and this is a common theme i see you mentioned uh, jocko willink who's a fantastic podcast and personal development podcast and and um great books and great content um you know everybody every i've seen this this common theme everybody from 50 cent his first chapter in his book is getting real you gotta get real with yourself about why we're you know what's not working address that stuff Major Dick Winters from Band of Brothers talks about leadership. He talks about first, again, first lesson is taking ownership and leading by example. So, yeah, I think that's a theme that could be good for a lot of men is just getting real and 
being honest with yourself about what's working, what's not working and what you need to do. Huge, huge. When you stop, when you, uh, when you accept responsibility and you stop lying to yourself or just release any excuse as valid quote unquote as it could be, there's so much power in it. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it seems like it. And, and I think another great place to start here for building self-assuredness would be your book. Tell us about it. Yeah, so my book is called Self-Assurance. It's, uh, yeah. I don't know for anybody who's watching videos, this is the cover here. Yeah, uh, yeah. I also have it. I couldn't find it for this interview. I think it's in a box since I just moved, but I also have it. Great read. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's, I actually just finished the audible version, which, uh, you know, another, another journey of, of self-assurance, it is very difficult to self narrate. It was important for me to do because the, the only audio books I can listen to are, are the ones that are narrated by the author. And so, well, it's not professional grade. I've, I've, I've gotten some compliments from it and it was, it's, uh, it went really well. So for those who don't actually like to like physically read books, that's available too. Um, but awesome. it's, yeah, thanks. but I mean, it's really exceeded my expectations. Like I said, I, I had no expectation on how many people would read it. I didn't know if I'd sell, you know, five copies or five hundred or five thousand or whatever. Um, and uh, and it's it's still sitting in. I think the ebook is still sitting in the top one hundred in three different categories. It hit number one bestseller in I think five different categories. Um, the feedback that I've gotten from from people of all sorts of demographics that I did not expect from. From 65 year old men to 40 year old women to you know um, 20 year olds, uh, it's it's been uh, really humbling and um, fulfilling. Uh, so I think there's a message in there that uh, that most people can can uh, can accept. And and you know the the feedback I've got it was it was two one of two things. So most people said either they it's the fastest book they ever read. And some of them read it in one sitting, which I was like, it's 250 pages. That's, that's like, wow. <laughs> um, or it was people who said, man, there was just so much that I had to think about that it took me forever to read. So just read a chapter and, and I really had to, to sit and, and self-reflect. And I thought both of those are, are incredible compliments. So, yeah. Yeah. Lots of great reviews on Amazon and the guys in men's group, I recommended your book and a bunch of them bought it and they all, raved about it so Beautiful. highly recommend that you, you you check it out i'll have a link in the show notes and all that so that uh you can check it out so people can check, check it out there jeremy yeah much appreciated yeah well i uh i really appreciate the time man you're such a great example of how to think about these things in healthy ways your transformation from you know basically being out on your own at 13 and getting into trouble and all that stuff to where you're at now is just so inspiring so hope you'll come back and do this again and uh looking forward to listening to your audiobook absolutely thanks man